I'm going to enjoy killing you very much. Did you know there was a Fantastic Four movie based on the popular Marvel comic book made in 1994? Wait, you didn't? Well, now you do. Today on Groovy Movies, we're going to check out some fantastic facts about the unreleased controversial movie, It's Fantastico! When films like Batman and Robin get a release, and this doesn't, then it shows we live in a very disturbing world. So let's get a groove on and check the Fantastic Four out. Excelsior! Groovy. That's for trying to kill my friends. Number 12, The Rights Issue. Well, what do you think? You look like a dork. Let's start right at the beginning, way back in 1986. The German producer, Bern Heisinger, who ran Constantine Films, and regardless of what you may think of him after watching this episode, he's produced four Resident Evil movies. The two Fantastic Four movies from 2005 and 2007, but more importantly, directed the never ending story, which he did actually end. That's so good. He was no slouch, that's for sure. Anyway, where were we? Yep, 1986. He got in touch with old Mr. Marvel himself, Stan Lee, and obtained the movie rights to make the first ever Fantastic Four movie. That was that though. The company sat on the rights like an elephant on the grass until they found the rights were going to expire in December 1992. We are the Fantastic Four, remember? If a movie started shooting before the deadline of December the 1st, 1992, you would get to keep the rights for another 10 years, which would eventually give him the chance to maybe make a bigger budgeted Fantastic Four, which he did, of course, in 2005. It was now September 1992. What happened next was truly bizarre and fantastic. Number 11. Roger Corman. I think everyone should check out a Roger Corman production at least once in their life for they are truly missing out otherwise. If they gave out Oscars for big balls movie making and getting low budget movies made using exceptional ingenuity and craziness, then he would have won it many times over. Roger Corman has been responsible one way or another for such classics as Vincent Price starring Fall of the House of Usher. No, not the pop star, in 1959. The Man with the X-Ray Eyes, 1963. And one of my favourites, Humanoids from the Deep, in 1980, which I've covered in another video, should you want to dive into it. They don't understand like we understand. <coughs> Eichinger knew Roger Corman was a master at getting movies made quickly on a cheap budget, so he went ahead and asked Corman to produce a movie on a $1 million budget, which wouldn't buy a set of shoelaces on a Marvel movie nowadays. We make our films for a fraction of the cost of major studios. Roger Corman producing a movie that would require extensive special effects to make a man made out of rock smash films and a stretchy rubbery man stretch everywhere. Nope, not Mr. Bean. This movie was surely not going to be quite fantastic. Number 10. Lloyd Kaufman. Lloyd Kaufman, the independent movie making genius that started Troma Studios, responsible for the type of movies you never knew you wanted, such as Class of New Kamai, Sergeant Kabuki Man, and of course many people's favourite covered in toxic shit Avenger hero, Toxic Avenger. Bring the kid! <laughs> He was initially asked to produce the Fantastic Four movie, but turned it down because he was a lifelong friend of Stan Lee, and Stan Lee was hoping a big studio would get hold of Fantastic Four and make a fantastic movie. So Kaufman said no out of loyalty to Stan Lee. Imagine that though, if Kaufman was involved, who knows in the future we may have had Toxic Avenger lining up alongside Oak and Captain America. How cool would that have been? It's brilliant. Number 9. The Casting the cast assembled to be fair, invest a lot into their roles. They totally believed in the movie and were so gutted when they found out it wasn't being released. With the movie having to be shot very quickly, the cast had to be found faster than a speeding human torch. Unbelievably, the cast were found in just over a week after an intensive audition process. Casting began in November 1983 and the film began shooting in December 1983. Alex Ide White, a British born actor, was cast as elasticated Dr. Reed Richards. He's been an actor since first appearing in the pilot episode of the 1978 Battlestar Galactica show. His role as Reed Richards was a bit of a stretch. He is now an in demand audiobook narrator. Rebecca Stabb, a former winner of the Miss Nebraska Beauty pageant, 
was a bit of an here and there actress who'd already appeared in the Wonder Year show, Cheers sitcom and Dark Shadows as Daphne Collins in 1991. Behind you. She was cast as the invisible girl Susan Storm, which may be appropriate because just like the invisible comic book character, nobody could see her in the movie afterwards. Now Jay Underwood was one of those actors who you'd see and think, I've seen him somewhere before. He was cast as Johnny Storm, the fiery flyboy, without even knowing who the Fantastic Four were at the time. Although he, along with the rest of the cast, immersed themselves in the comic books. Because of the limited budget, he rarely got to flame on in the movie. Jay Underwood, who starred in The Boy Who Could Fly and Uncle Buck, gave up acting years back to become a pastor. It's clobbering. If the ult were made out of rock, then this is what it'd be like. Now two people were cast as Ben Grimm, there's a surname and half, who would transform into a walking, talking rock man. Primarily a stunt performer on such movies as Beverly Hills Cop 3, Mission Impossible 3. Carl Chiafalio, it seems, was destined to be in comic book movies, as he'd also performed in Daredevil 2012 and The Amazing Spider-Man 2012. Michael Bayless Smith played the human side of the Ben Grimm character. After he got the role, he was a little pissed because he thought he'd also play the thing, but found out Carl Chiafalio, the actor come stuntman, was playing that role. Bayless Smith has been in a lot of shows, like X-Files, but for the Vampire Slayer. Chuck and Wings, one of my favourite shows that nobody seems to remember. He also played another monster, Pluto, in the Hills of Eyes remake. Wait, one of the Fantastic Four was a mutant inbred. Joseph Culp got the star turn playing Doctor Doom part in the movie. Who is the Fantastic Four what Joker is to Batman? Well, it's Luther to Superman, Doc Ock to Spider-Man, you get the drift. He certainly looked the part and thought it's going to be the role that pushes his acting career into the stratosphere. But as we know, that couldn't happen. Although he's appeared in many movies and shows, he's most known for portraying Don Draper's dad, Archie Whitman, in the hugely successful Mad Men TV series. No, 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 no! I have not even started! Another actor actually auditioned for the role of Doctor Doom, but he obviously never got it. It was none other than Mark Ruffalo. It may have been a blessing in disguise. He would go on later to play Bruce Banner the Hulk in the Marvel Studios movies. Fantastic clobbering time! Number 8. Budget Issues The budget was a miserable $1.5 million. That was not going to cut the mustard when it came to the special effects. To make a comparison, take a look at the E-Man movie in 1987. That cost $22 million. The 1989 Punisher movie starring Dolph Lundgren. Hey Dolph just loves these type of movies doesn't he? Well that cost $9 million and they didn't have to showcase a man turning into flames or a man stretching his way around the screen. Director Jorge Sassone, who had directed music videos before taking on the Fantastic Four project, knew he had a problem when he saw the budget. New Horizon Pictures, who were set to release the movie, wanted it shot quickly to save money. It was shot in a staggeringly short 25 days. Sassone knew he did not have enough money for extensive special effects. A fair bit was spent on the Thing costume, so Jorge Sassone gathered the actors to his house to let them know the budget was utter dog crap. But to pull together and make it the damn best movie they can make it. Hell yeah! You may call me Doctor Doom. The movie composers David and Eric Worst actually paid out $6,000 out of their own money to hire an orchestra. They thought it was worth the risk because if the movie became a smash hit, it would do wonders for their credibility. The actors under the Thing and Doctor Doom costume would sometimes find their lines have come out muffled due to the costumes. No problem, as with most movies, they sometimes have the actors record the line and it is then dubbed over the scenes. But because of time and budget issues, the muffled scenes were left as they are. Take my back. Keep your When the studio stopped getting involved, cast members put together a bundle of cash and hired publicists to promote the movie, even as far as arranging a panel at the San Diego Comic Con. Little did they know the movie was never intended for release. Number 7. Stan Lee was not a happy man. The Fantastic Four comic book was like a child to Stan Lee, except made out of paper. He adored it. He was hoping a big studio like Warner Brothers or Fox Studios would take it on by buying the rights when they expire and making a massive big budget movie. But as we know, Horizon Movies and Cost Staten Movies quickly put the movie into production before expiration date and kept the rights for another 10 years. Stanley was fuming and when asked about the new Fantastic Four movie, 
He had this to say in 1993 at San Diego Comic Con. It will be released sometime, I think, the end of this year. And it, I'm not expecting too much of it. It's the last movie to be made that we at Marvel had no control over. Ouch! Upon hearing about the disparaging remarks, the cast and crew admit it hit a raw nerve, especially as he seemed quite happy with it when visiting the set. Number 6. The Condemned Location Most of the movie, with its more elaborate scenes for want of a better term, was shot on a soundstage in Venice, California. Sounds great, right? In the name of God of Gorilla Spandex, it was a disused warehouse on an industrial estate. Working on this movie almost spelt doom for the casting crew. Sets used in the previous Roger Corman movie, Carnosaur, were used for Fantastic Four. They were made of foam and polystyrene. They were cheap, and I mean, what's this down the back of the sofa cheap? After scenes have been shot, the cast and crew will paint things like paper cups and stick them to the wall to make them look like fancy computer knobs. The building had actually been condemned by a fire marshal, but Corman still had them shoot there. Condemned signs around the building were covered up, but Constantin Studios were rumbled when one sign was accidentally left uncovered, so the cast found out and were told to watch where they stepped as they could fall through the floor. Yeah, I love walking into a trap, don't you? I don't know, I've never done it before. On several occasions, huge rats were seen scurrying from under sound blankets and across the set. So, did they get pest controlling? Did they shoot elsewhere? Nope, this was a common production after all. The studio got a cat. That's right, they hired a cat who would hunt the rats down. The cat grew to love the cast members and would often try and play with them. Probably thought they were action figures. Maybe it was a fantastic paw fan. The cat was called Lucy, and because it was such a badass, I'm sure there would have been a sequel, it would have been cast as a Fantastic Four villain, Gal Capticus. <laughs> Number 5, the not so fantastic special effects. The budget, as you know, was incredibly low, so nobody was expecting Marvel Studios style special effects, but still, they are incredibly ropey and look like the film was made in the 70s and not the 90s. The long elasticated arms used for Reed Richards' character were non-flexible bits of rubber and holes stuck together. They couldn't create a great effect as the budget wouldn't stretch that far. Optic Nerve were the special effects company that worked on the Ben Grimm thing suit. They created a casing that would fit around the actors. One was just a well-designed structured suit with no facial movement that the thing actor Carl Chiafalio could crash through walls and onto the floor with. Clobbering time indeed. They also designed an animatronic suit that looked pretty impressive and also allowed the actor's eyes to remote. It was very similar in design to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle suit used for the movie in 1990. It was a pretty damn good suit and the most faithful version so far of the thing in the Fantastic Four movie world. The thing suit was created before the movie was even cast, which is why they have Carl Chiafalio in the suit and Michael Baylor Smith playing his human alter ego, as Michael Baylor Smith was built like a brick dump house and was so tall he could not fit into the suit. Now Sue Storm, played by Rebecca Stab, had the power of invisibility. This effect was achieved with the camera being paused while shooting and Rebecca Starb quickly ducking under the camera as well as some nifty editing. It was that simple. I still have to keep reminding myself this movie was made in 1994 and not 1974. Look at it. See it. Now as for the effects for the human torch, well that needs its own chapter. Come on. <laughs> oh man it's bad. Number 4. The Human Torch Wow, if you've not seen the Human Torch effect, then prepare to have your mind blown by how ludicrous it is. Flame on! It does have a rather mysterious story behind it. The studio stopped investing in the movie. It had hit a wall, and there was no explanation why, so director Oli Sassoni had the movie footage smuggled out to him, so he could edit and finish the film. He gave a visual effects artist the job of creating effects for Johnny Storm. This effects artist got the job because he told them he'd done the effects for Independence Day. It was soon to be found out it was pure bullshit. 
He didn't know what he was doing and churned out this embarrassment on the screen. The effect was so bad, even early vintage sci-fi channel would have said, what the hell is this? The FX artist disappeared, leaving the movie in special effects limbo. So Holly Sassoni turned to a special effects artist called Mr. Film, which really does sound like a username off YouTube. They did an half decent job with what was left of the budget. Simply no excuse for bad effects nowadays, is there? I've got a right itchy foot. It's lucky that I've developed these superpowers so I can stretch my legs. Yeah, yeah. I'll just take my shoe off. Number 3, The Dreaded Phone Call The movie was set to have its world premiere at the Mall of America in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Cast and crew are paid out of their own pocket to stage the event. They'd done appearances at comic conventions. They told friends and family they were part of the Fantastic Four movie. The excitement was off the Richter scale, but the rocky road this movie had took to get to this point was going to get even rockier. It was an avalanche of rocks. Audio, it would be the fitting instrument of my return. Avi Arad was the chief creative officer for Marvel. He would go on later to create Marvel Studios, who create all those big budget flashy Marvel movies that are on at the cinema every other week. He got wind of a Roger Corman produced a low budget Fantastic Four movie, and he was thinking about future projects and felt this movie would be detrimental for the Fantastic Four product. He was quickly on the phone to Roger Corman. I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Sorry for the Marlon Brando impression. He would have to hand over all copies of the movie, and for the time, trouble and effort Corman Productions had gone to, Roger Corman would receive a nice bribe, uh, sorry, I mean paycheck, to not release the movie, and just pretend it doesn't exist. Roger Corman was soon on the phone to Holly Sassoni, and told him the film was never going to be released. The premiere had a cease and desist order. Holly Sassoni was devastated, not just for himself, but for the cast and crew who had put their art into it. You let them know. They were stunned. It would soon come to light why the movie was dumped. Number 2. The Bootleg It was claimed Avi Arad had all the copies of the Fantastic Four film. After the Fantastic Four gate controversy, to which he had them set on fire, not by Johnny Storm though, but somehow, somewhere, a bootleg copy on a VHS had found its way into somebody's hands. These were then transferred onto DVD, and DVD copies were being sold at comic conventions, and eBay, and down the pub no doubt. Rebecca Starb was told by a friend the film was on eBay, and there it was so she bought a copy. Carl Chiafalio was at a comic convention, browsing around when he did a double take and saw a bootleg copy for sale for $10. He told the seller he was amazed the film had somehow escaped into the real world and that he actually starred in it playing the thing. He now had the DVD in his hand and was still charged $10 for it. Always Sassoni said he's disappointed the picture quality isn't up to much as he never got to finish it but it is a copy of a copy of a copy and he's glad there's a bootleg copy doing the rounds as it has given the film a new lease of life. How often do you hear of a director that's actually glad his movie's been bootlegged? What a strange situation. It's a fun, charming movie that captures the spirit and the look of the comic. It's not that good, but it does warm the art, and I'm glad the actor's got to finally own a copy. With that to Joseph Culp being able to show his son the time he played Doctor Doom, his son grew up loving the film and dressed like Doctor Doom. His father holds it in his art as a special time. Oh, that's sweet. I love it. Number 1. Arrested Development Arrested Development was a TV comedy that was into its fourth season by 2013 after a brief cancellation. It starred Jason Bateman and Will Harnett. It was a quirky smart comedy about a dysfunctional family. And what does this in the name of Richard Reese spandex pants have to do with this video? Well seeing as you asked. One of the characters, Tobias, tries to make a living performing as a Fantastic Four character on the streets as well as becoming involved in a musical about the unreleased Fantastic Four movie. Hey, that's pretty damn good for a movie nobody was supposed to see. It has, over the years, gained cult status, and it's nice to see the film being appreciated. It's subscribing time. Intrigue, lies, deception, marvel, danger, it's at it all. I'm glad this movie got a release. An unofficial one, but a release all the same. At one point, it looked like Charles Manson had more chance of being released than this movie. What did you think of the movie? What did you think of this video? 